So, uh, we are happy to have today yeah, Roberto Francesini, who is now at CERN. Uh, Roberto did his PhD, I think, in Pisa, yes. and uh, then made a postdoc in, in Lausanne, and another one in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And since last year, he's now for a two year fellowship at CERN. And today, he will talk uh, about a very experimental subject, I think. Talk about mass measurements on the bottom. So yes. Please. Ah, thanks for reading out there. <laughs> this is where the theory is coming, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for the nice introduction for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas that we are developing in collaboration with Kasu Bagashe at the University of Maryland, exactly, when I was a postdoc uh, before going to CERN. Dojin Kim, that back then uh, was also at uh, uh, Maryland as a student. And uh, Marcus Schulze was instead uh, uh, another fellow at CERN, uh, which joined our effort since I moved uh, to, to Geneva. Okay, so the title, as you see, it's quite clear, it's about the uh, top work masses, but I, I should give a, a disclaimer in a sense that it's about partly why we are doing this the way we do it and uh, what, from where we come from. And um, so this is in a sense the culmination of a series of works where we were trying to get an answer for, uh, a, more, for a more general question about measuring masses which is not about just the top of mass, but more in general, masses of any particle, and uh, in particular, masses of uh, beyond the standard model uh, particles. So, I, I think uh, when you will see how, you know, things, you know, what, what, what things make different uh, our ideas for the top work measurement, uh, you can quickly relate these facts to questions that easily arise in more, in more say, general context. For instance, when you try to measure many masses at the same time in a process that could be the gluing a decay in comparison of bottoms to our own shell bottom, is bottom actually, in, uh, in, uh, in supersymmetry. So, these were, were the type of questions we started with in 2012, trying to find a method that could efficiently and reliably, and not making many assumptions, especially, get the masses of the new particles in this diagram. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you will learn how these questions are actually relevant for the top work mass. Now, the study that we present for the top work mass, if you want, it's either a, a way, maybe a good way, or maybe not so good way, to obtain the top work mass. But more generally speaking, it's, it's the say precision uh, generalization, the precision say improvement of methods that were developed for this type of physics and that were initially proven only as leading order methods, so good for a order 10% measurements, uh, that now we are specializing to a specific example, which is uh, instead you know, needed to be known at the 1% level, where our old uh, theory, if you like, wasn't really uh, 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 suitable anymore. Okay, so besides uh, you know, this, why we do that, in the sense of why I do that, now I can tell you a little bit why we should look at the top work mass, you know, besides my reasons of what I did in 2012 and now what I'm doing in 2015. Um, and the answer, you know, to why we look at the top work mass, I think it depends a little bit on your interest, but more generally speaking, uh, I would say that there is a, a lot of interest in knowing the top work mass because it's uh, one of the fundamental parameters of the standard model. And uh, on top of that, it's the top interaction, the Yukawa interaction that gives the top mass also, it's the cornerstone of essentially most of the beyond the standard model extensions that uh, at least those that try to, uh, to, to, to study uh, uh, the, uh, the gauge year the problem. So those that are, for instance, explaining why the Higgs delta is so small compared to the black mass. So here I'm just collecting a few things that maybe for the, this audience are quite well known, so we go fast. For instance, uh, uh, the fact that the top work mass here is the vertical axis of a plot where people has computed the standard model Higgs potential at high energies. And when you evaluate the high energies, the potential can change shape. In particular, can become unstable and uh, have a runaway direction. And uh, the fact that if this happens or not essentially depends on how strong is the Yukawa interaction of the top, how strong is changing uh, the Higgs uh, potential. And if the Higgs, sorry, if the top is too heavy, in fact, you normally you know, you can easily end up in a, uh, in a potential which is unstable, it's unbounded from below. At scales uh, that might be in the order of 10 to 10 GB. So if you're trying to ask a question 
is the standard model fundamental theory that it's valid up to very high energies. Okay, maybe you know that there are the zero masses, dark matter, and other things that we don't know about, and so you know that these things will certainly tell you no, the standard model is not the final theory. But if you get an even more conservative attitude and you expect these things could be solved in some way which we don't know, uh, you can still try to check if the standard model is valid to say 10 to 10 GB. And you will you discover that if the top mass was a bit too heavy, you would know already the answer is no, because 10 to 10 GV, the standard model doesn't make sense anymore due to this phenomenon. And okay, this is the result of a very complicated calculations where there is essentially uh, um, the top quark mass in the vertical axis, the Higgs mass, which is now known very well, uh, in the horizontal axis. And people in this parameter space confuse where the standard model works perfectly, where it's unstable at some a high scale where we are kind of okay still, or where it's so unstable that our vacuum essentially would have decayed in another vacuum long before we, we were here in second to, to discuss the issue. Um, and you see the top work is a very important input here. They do the calculation uh, as a function of the four mass. And uh, just for giving you an idea how important it is to know it precisely, I'm putting a duck band, which is the one sigma current measurement, from the most precise measurement, uh, interpreted as if it was exactly the, a measurement of the top core mass, which is probably true, probably not so true. Or, instead, since this calculation uses the Hermes bar mass as, a, as an input, I'm putting the error bar of what is the direct determination of the Hermes bar mass from the top core section. Now, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself for giving you all this information and details, but you see that two different things, huh? are anyways both quite large compared to the region that distinguishes a stable versus an unstable, uh, unstable potential. And if you go very conservatively and take uh, the direct measurement of what is used as an input in this calculation, you would take these much bigger error bars, and then you see that uh, you really need to improve this measurement because otherwise, in basically, within the two sigma level, uh, this calculation ranges from being completely unstable over here down to stable. So you're not able to conclude anything on the question you were asking on the validity of the standard model just because you don't know the MS bar mass well enough. They don't have masses in red, uh, the lines in red, in red? These are the scales at which you develop uh, 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 another minimum, essentially. So <clears throat> these are, a sense, gauging uh, what it means to be absolutely stable because you basically move this phenomenon to beyond the plant mass. Or if it's starting to get lower and lower, at some point your probability to tunnel into something close by gets too large and then you call it unstable. In between there is this region where maybe the lifetime is okay with the lifetime of the universe, but uh, even there you know this calculation is not exactly straightforward, so maybe you trust the order of magnitude, maybe not even that. Okay, so the others are showing more general uh, other things, but uh, I don't know if it's worth going to all of them. Basically, it's what uh, I was saying, you know, there are tests in the electronic precision test of the standard model, so here year as well, the top mass is linked through loops in other masses, and that's why you want to measure precisely. In case you discover SUSY, you need to make a prediction for the Higgs mass, and that's where the MSSN, for instance, takes the top mass as an input in the loop corrections, which are essentially what makes the MSSM survive, you have a fourth power dependence on the top mass, which is one of the big contributions at the end of the day to the errors. Uh, and also, it's quite interesting that since these days we don't see any supersymmetry, people have started to consider how to hide the stops, for instance, in the top sample. And uh, this is done uh, by having stops that decay in final state that are really top light. Uh, and there, people have computed essentially what happens if I change uh, the stop and the top mass simultaneously, and then I consider production of both of them at the same time. What do you actually, you know, uh, get in your detectors? And the result is that uh, you may live in this white band, uh, where essentially you, if you got a too light, uh, say, I'm sorry, a too heavy top, and then you get lower cross sections. You can compensate with some lightish uh, stop that is filling in you know, the difference between uh, the expected number of events uh, and, uh, and the top, uh, the top uh, and the actual top uh, uh, production. Uh, however, uh, then you know that top mass is measured somewhere else, you know, it's known from other sources. And if you put in uh, um, the, the, the value that is obtained uh, from a pretty model independent measurement, which is one based uh, 
on um, essentially on the endpoint uh, of the uh, left on sorry, from the W and the B port. Okay, we will make an estimate of the top mass uh, looking at the invalid mass of these two objects. Uh, if you take a measurement from there, which is known with giving you top mass being two GBs, you can restrict a lot the ranges of stops that are still allowed in this kind of game where you are trying to hide the, the stops to look into the top. So, uh, this is just to give you a flavor of how many th different things you can actually do uh, once you know well uh, the top mass. Can you do that hiding? I mean, what is the price of hiding the stop that way? For uh, the naturalness of the theory? But it's fine. I mean, uh, uh, if you're really looking bottom up, I'd say that uh, a bottom up evaluation of the fine tuning is perfectly fine until you reach 500 GBs or so for the average stop mass. Um, now, okay, you can ask uh, how comes uh, that I got the top uh, and the stop uh, within, uh, I don't know, here it's maybe, well, it's say 70 GBs, so it's not that bad. Uh, but yeah, you can start asking questions if you want to the UV model. How comes that I've got exactly uh, yeah, 250 or a value of that sort uh, for, for the stop? And also the other squarks would be heavy, right? The other families. The, so yes, how you need to decouple the rest. In these scenarios, you normally think of oh, stops are light, gluinos maybe even heavier than, than, than the light than the other generations of squarks. I mean, does um, it fit in minimal supergravity? Uh, there is a way to obtain uh, uh, something like this, but I forgot for what is the lowest high scale you have to input, which essentially is the following. Uh, you should take uh, uh, the, the, the scalar masses large at the, at the UV, the fermion mass is low, the fermion masses start running as you go uh, towards the lower energies, but they are still small compared to the scalars, so they don't really affect the scalar masses. That means uh, that uh, you don't see the usual effect of the Bruino dragging uh, all the stops uh, and the squarks uh, to very uh, large masses. Now, for the light and the stop, there is an effect from the Yukawa uh, coupling that drives it uh, uh, light. The left and the stops instead still goes up. So at the end, you manage to do these kind of things. There is an upper bound on how heavy you get the Bruino. I mean, it can, cannot be infinitely heavy in this scenario. There is a way. I think this can work for ice scales uh, pretty large, maybe not necessarily close to gut or red blood, but close to it. Uh, like we can check uh, later, uh, say how much we can stretch <laughs> this mechanism to obtain it. Okay, so it's possible to have a similar spectrum, okay, in, uh, even in a UV scenario. So I think it's a good question that people is trying to get into this kind of. Uh, Okay, now what is the challenge? The challenge is that uh, uh, all these measurements are very sensitive, all these predictions are very sensitive to the top mass, and uh, at the moment, uh, uh, you know, we realize that we need to know it at the level of 1% essentially to get a good, a good sense of, uh, of what I had in the previous time. And uh, this could be doable because already now there are out there measurements that essentially give you some number with uh, half a percent uh, uh, precision. The only problem is that these are measurements of, of uh, essentially QCD physics done at the half percent level, which normally means uh, that leading order, say, Monte Carlo are good enough. You need to have uh, better predictions than that. And the picture, it's clear that it's a very messy one, so you need really to make 100% uh, sure that you're understanding every detail of what we're talking about. This is a standard picture that Sherpa authors show to, to to describe how complicated is the Hadron collisions. Uh, and essentially, the message that they are trying to give is that uh, while normally in perturbative QCD we just compute the hard scattering and we are happy with that, in real life there are many more things that can happen, like a secondary interaction where extra jets are produced on top of the normal top production here, and then there is also radiation which is not very, which is kind of understood in perturbative QCD, yes, but uh, maybe not at the level of half percent. And then there are phenomena like the polarization and the decay of other offsets you need to take into account as well. And, uh, you know, pretending that you know such a busy picture, each step at the level of uh, less than one percent, it's very demanding. So this 
calls for some caution anytime you did uh, or uh, try to think about uh, a, measure, a measurement of anything in QCD better than 1%, I would say, and top mass is not essential. You need to have really everything well under control. Now, um, I think uh, the, the important message to be taken out of this clear difficulty that there is in getting a precise measurement is that uh, one single method may give you a good number, say with a small error, but really by looking at that number alone, you don't learn enough, in my, in my opinion. You learn much more the moment that you have several measurements. Each of the measurements may be doing, uh, uh, you know, se being sensitive to different parts of these pictures in different ways, and uh, at the end of the day, giving you a consistent picture of a global determination of the top mass, not just a single measurement, but many measurements. So, uh, ideally, you know, looking just at the experimental side, you would like to have different subdetectors playing different roles because each of them has different system addicts, and so you better have, uh, say, cross checks of one thing on the other. But even just looking at the, the theory side, whenever you, you, you write a prediction based on Monte Carlo's for the pictures I showed before, the busy picture from, from the Sherpa people, uh, you are making a number of actually choices that you need to make in order to complete the calculation, which nature, you know, doesn't know about. So there are uh, choices that you do due to the fact that you are doing a fixed standard calculation. You have to choose a scale for the calculation. If you make the scale depend on the kinematics, even the way the kinematics enters in the scale choice, it's another choice. And there are lots of effects uh, like uh, the widths or uh, color neutralization, uh, atomization, as I mentioned, how radiation happens uh, in resonances. This is another thing normally you have to make a choice about. And none of them is very, you can really defend on prime principles. So you need to make you know, statements that can be tested in some other way. And uh, normally, in the single method that you propose for, that mark, for the measurements, you cannot test, say, too much in situ what is happening with each of these choices. And the best way of doing it is to compare your results with other, uh, with other measurements. So ideally, what I'm looking for is to get uh, an M-top axis here uh, and several different measurements that come from very different measurements, very different techniques and very different uh, theory, you know, underlying each of them. Possibly some of them is more precise, like this yellow one. Some of them might be not very precise, like the brown one here. But it's just by looking at them combined that you really make you know, a meaningful average of these numbers and you get a, a, a robust uh, you know, determination of the mass. Uh, it's by looking very close that you build confidence, in my opinion. Because, after all, you, know, you might end up uh, with a situation like this one where you have a yellow point, which is a very precise measurement, this one. So this is very precise, but it's also, compared to the other very precise measurements we have here, not agreeing very well. And uh, then uh, I think you have a problem, because you are trying to measure something at 1% or less. Maybe each of these measurements is 1% or less, and then uh, they don't agree with each other. Um, maybe it means that you're not understanding you know, this complicated electronic scattering well enough, Maybe it means that you have to fix your picture of the next capitalists. Anyways, it's calling for some, you know, maybe at least a reappraisal of what you were doing. Eventually, it might even be that we, we are stuck in a situation like that, you know? We should surrender to the fact that despite what method A or method B or method C are saying, the error on what we think is the top mass uh, cannot be this small, but has to be probably of the order of uh, the difference between these two points or the brown one. Something like that. It's not guaranteed that after all, uh, you know, the theory understanding mostly, I would say, it's, well, it's good enough uh, that we can really pin down a number that we can make sense of to the level that we're seeking of uh, uh, five per million. So uh, this is, what I think, the playground, uh, trying to get, uh, say, the global determination of the mass. And for this global determination, for instance, we have already a projection. CMS has done, but also theory people has contributed to it. And uh, there is, in fact, already out there a number of things that CMS is ready to operate and uh, eventually to bring it uh, to the, uh, I don't know, 30 years from now, uh, the inverse up to about 40 TV uh, extrapolations, where you see different methods are evaluated at current precision, but also, most important, what will be the final number from the HC. 
I guess it's, it's a very relevant to, to mention that all, all of these lines are really you know, different ideas. It's not just using a different channel, but then doing pretty much the same treatment of the data. There are measurements that exploit uh, the, the, the path that the PE hadrons are flying, which is, you know, the longer, the, the more massive the, the, the top is, um, uh, the more the top is massive due to the mass being transferred into momentum, and momentum meaning boost. When uh, the, the, the PE hadron is more boosted because of the more massive top, it travels longer distances. So if you measure this distance, you have an idea of, uh, well, you can correlate it to the top mass. Or they're maybe using uh, this endpoint uh, method I was checking, I was drawing in the board before, which is again a, a different type of measurement. There are measurements based on exclusive final states uh, from uh, the hadrons that decay in JPS eyes, which themselves decay in leptons. And so they use, uh, you know, different, let's say, theories, because they rely on naturalization, for instance, uh, and they use also different uh, detectors, because they, they rely on leptons. So, this diversity is put in this plot, and the goal, I think, at the end is to get all these methods to go somewhere below 1 GB, and finally check them against each other. So, what I want to do in the rest of half hour is essentially to think to another method that could be added to this, and eventually combined at the very end uh, the LNC to check if there is a good understanding of the top core mass, and we can play with a half GB or 700 MBs number. Or uh, we, we don't understand it well enough. So to discuss uh, uh, this idea, I have to uh, kind of uh, review a little bit the role of Lorentz invariance when we invent observables that can make us uh, uh, learn about the top core mass. Uh, invariance, like for instance, uh, the mass that I was uh, mentioning before, the finite mass of the bottom of the left corner in the top K. Uh, and also the role of uh, reconstructing resonances, which would be, in this case, uh, if you could measure the, the, the neutrino, you know, putting together all the three for momenta and doing a uh, for, uh, for vector of them in the square. So, uh, yeah. Okay, for Lorentz invariants, I think the best way to show how important they are and how good they are, if you can make one, is to look at the Z decay. So Z bosons are measured, uh, well, in a different many different places, but let's say that you have any collider that makes a Z boson, a very good way to measure its mass is to let the Z decay to leptons. Uh, measure both leptons, making sure you got the, the right leptons, so it's not an issue I want to discuss, but in, if you can do that, just make uh, the measurements of uh, uh, the two four vectors of the muons, which means you're measuring eight numbers. So two energies and uh, two times three components of uh, the momenta. And then you can make a square and obtain uh, the mass of the Z as the peak essentially of the distribution of uh, this observable. This is very nice because uh, it, as long as you have alpha Z on shell, it's basically putting you, you know, in a very safe place where the Z has this same distribution in the rest frame of the Z or in the laboratory frame where you produced it. It does have this distribution the same, whatever are the, for instance, the parking distribution functions that you use to, uh, to produce uh, the Z. So it could be a lepton collider, it could be a hadron collider, you expect uh, more or less the same thing. This means that more in detail, you don't care if you QQ bar or, or a group group production of Z. So you don't care if it is standard model production of Z, or maybe this Z is generated by beyond the standard model interactions. All of them, they go, in, if you want, in the same plot, and they clearly show the Z mass of D. There are, of course, little details you have to ch check when you want to make a precision measurement of the Z boson, because this, is not, uh, this picture is not good enough. But you see that there are clear advantages of having used a Lorentz invariant, because it brings in all these uh, insensitivities to uh, you know, known uh, problems, or let's call it uh, uh, the issues like the dependence on production mode and part on distribution functions that are normally part of the story that you have to discuss for uh, a, a mass measurement and its sensitivity to your theory and calculation. Now, uh, in general, uh, this is a good trick, uh, but uh, it cannot be applied in general. For instance, for the W boson, uh, you need uh, to measure a neutrino, and then you're already out of business because the neutrino cannot be detected. So, the previous idea of making an invariant mass of the two final states cannot be applied uh, 
just for absence uh, of, uh, of measurable particles. Normally, you know, if you look in the literature, there is a lot of ideas how to get around this, uh, looking at transverse masses or Jacobian peaks or anything. Uh, but all of these are, in a sense, tricks made for the purpose. So they solve this problem of the double production at Tabaton, let's say, but they might not solve the same problem at the LHC, or they might not solve the same problem for a generic production of W, say, pair production of W, maybe they are not solving. And uh, this is where our 2012 mindset comes back, where you start asking the question, what happens if I discover supersymmetry, and now instead of having a, a W, I have a squark, the squirt decays into one jet, and maybe an invisible staple dark matter candidate. And you have no idea what is the mass of the dark matter candidate, whereas you knew that the neutrino was massless in the previous example. You will know how have the complication that squirts are produced in pair, whereas Ws were produced singly. And you realize that what you learned from the W is maybe not so helpful for this case, because you really have to make another trick, essentially. So our question was, how do I make progress in measuring the masses of squarks and uh, the neutral in this case in full generality without having to resolve every time, diagram by diagram, essentially, production mechanism by production mechanism on a special you know, feature of the process. Of course, it's good to have special features to be exploited because then you can use them. Uh, but if you want to have a general answer, no, we realize that uh, there might be not enough that you are able to and uh, in fact, uh, it turned out, uh, turned out that our answer is su sufficiently general that uh, eventually can be used for top works, which uh, most of times, at least the, uh, say, a fraction of the times, go into semi-invisible final states with neutrinos to the W file. And so the question I asked for squarks, uh, in the end, uh, it's useful uh, to uh, answer a question on top works. Uh, you will see how uh, the way I made progress on this, uh, it depends uh, on essentially detaching leaving uh, the shore of uh, invalid masses that I made here, where, you know, which is again uh, something you cannot try for the squat decay, and going towards the other extreme, uh, taking a fully Lorentz violent object, I will show you how these things uh, can be recovered. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the other issue is to do with reconstruction. Uh, I pointed the slide to it for the Z boson example, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, even in the Z boson there was the chance uh, that the Z uh, made the decay into muons. Those muons themselves can radiate photons, and maybe some of these photons are very energetic, and you need to do something. Okay? If you don't catch those photons, you will not see the Z peak. Uh, so, or you have any way to treat the delta emission in some way to, to really measure the top, sorry, the Z mass uh, uh, factor. For the top quark, it is essentially the same story. We uh, just the drawback that uh, the emission rates are much larger because it's QCD emissions um, and not QED emissions that worries you. And so, whenever you think of uh, I reconstruct the top by looking at uh, all the final states that this decay too, because I measure them, you also have to take into account that somewhere there might be an extra blue one emitted, say, in the decay which you didn't capture, or that if you capture, sorry, that, or that you have to take into account somehow in your calculations. This is a problem in general whenever you try to make a, 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 what is called a template measurement. In a template measurement, you basically make a simulation in which you obtain uh, some distributions for different uh, of masses. And these distributions are, uh, say, some observable, which say, it could be the mass of three jets. Uh, I don't know if this is used, but let's say something of that type, which uh, is predicted uh, by your simulation for uh, an empty, empty plus delta and empty plus two delta, being delta the space of the number two are essentially probing uh, on. And looking at the data and finding which of these distribution fits best, you will realize if you're measuring an MT or MT plus 1 GB, which is to know, MT plus delta or 2 or 2 delta, comparing this prediction with the data. Now, it's crucial that you make these templates with a very accurate prediction, with a very accurate theory calculations. And it's not trivial uh, what to do when you have this type of phenomena, because some of them, uh, they may not even be present in the description of Monte Carlo's you're using. This goes back uh, to the 
how complicated is that picture plenty of blocks that I draw at the beginning from the shape of the Carlo Autos, uh, where uh, not everything can be described to infinite precision because as theorists you cannot compute everything well enough. So um, this is an issue and uh, as I said uh, you have the same problem for the Z boson where you have these photons that are emitted from, uh, uh, from the muons. Uh, there are different ways to address it. Uh, when the photons are soft and large, uh, there are different phenomena and different ways to account for it. But you have to do something about it. You cannot just uh, forget it. If you don't do it, in general, you have to admit that you have a theory uncertainty in your mass measurement simply because maybe you didn't consider hard photons uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the decay. Or in my case, because I didn't have hard gluons emitted in the top decay properly in the calculation which I would say it has been like that for some time, at least uh, for, some, uh, for some theory calculations. Uh, so it's not an academic problem, it's something which exists uh, in, uh, in real life. So given this, I like to distinguish the measurements in two types, uh, not to say that one is better than the other, but going back to what I said at the beginning, are two different types that have different good features and different bad features. Sometimes they are complementary, sometimes they are the same, sometimes they are both bad. Uh, so uh, there is one measurement where I think uh, of uh, reconstructing the top the way I was reconstructing a Z-boson uh, uh, making an effort to identify all the final states in which the top has decayed and uh, putting them together in this orange uh, detector uh, where I am actually you know, trying to make essentially the invalid mass of the top maybe not exactly that but something of that sort or I just take another attitude and I say, I don't care what the top has done, if the top has decayed uh, or, or its own share of share, I don't know. I just know that I have a process that is mediated by the top. Say so it could be the p hadron production. p huh? hadron production that I mentioned before, uh, and then I look at just at the p hadron that, it, that comes from, from the top. Uh, I know that some property of this final state, in that case it was the decay length, it's linked to the top mass. And then I have to make my job the calculation of the correlation between that observable, in that case the length of the decay of the top, the piadron, and uh, the top mass. Another option could be look at the lepton and look at this, the PT or the, you know, the energetics anyways of that lepton, which of course talks to the top mass itself. The advantage of course here is that I never have to specify, uh, or at least I am less sensitive to the fact that I have to I reconstruct a top and find all the different decay products. Uh, there, are, there are, of course, in general, uh, uh, other issues uh, in this type of measurement. But as I said, if you have both of them that can reach a good precision, and at the end of the day you can compare, I think it's a good check that you are understanding the clock of picture to the level of accuracy that you're talking about. Okay, so given all the variances that you can make of these two methods, it's not surprising, I believe, uh, that you can make a long list of different ideas that people have put on the market to, to measure the top mass. Uh, and uh, one of those, which is the one we discussed, is the based on energy gigs. It's our results uh, from 2012 that are living order results. Plus, uh, today I show you some preliminary results on uh, next living order precision that uh, we are obtaining at the moment. So the idea is to use an energy, energy distributions um, which uh, uh, enjoy special properties, kind of surprising special, uh, which were demonstrated uh, in this 2012 paper. Uh, and the statement is just the following, that uh, uh, despite the energy being a Lorentz uh, variant quantity, so changes in every frame you go, this is by Lorentz transformation, uh, in suitable conditions for suitable experiments, and the LHC experiment are one of those suitable experiments, there is a memory of the Lorentz invariance of the problem, in, that case, in this case the top mass, which is an invariant of the problem, that can be extracted from the distribution of the energy of, the, in our case, the big works uh, that come from the top of uh, the Now, given suitable condition is the crucial part, but you will see there's a these are really simple conditions uh, to be uh, fulfilled at the LHC. Um, now, the thing is quite simple, and I can basically show it in two slides. Uh, yet it, it has some subtleties, and that's why we call the, uh, the paper that way 2012. And it has essentially to do with a simple picture of a decay of the top cork in the peak in a public also. Now, this is just a living order picture, and I will have no width, no, no nothing, no mass of the B, in fact, for the moment. 
you will see later how these things can be added as perturbation on the basic result. Okay, so imagine you switch on LHC, you measure tops, but you will say measure them not at rest, you will measure them flying with some velocity in, uh, in your detector. This is what happens in every, in every collision which produces a top. Now, if you go back to the system where the top was at rest, everything looks simple. In that frame, you can imagine uh, to keep track of the velocity of the top, but with this angle, this, sorry, this um, beta, beta uh, vector, which is the beta velocity, the, uh, the relativistic velocity of the top in the, in the, in the last frame. Uh, and then, if you imagine you knew this vector, you can go back to the frame where the top sits at rest, and you can observe it decay. It will decay in a P and a W. You can track an angle beta, sorry, an angle between beta and the B uh, quark that I call beta. I know the beta uh, value of the boost of the top, so I know everything that allows me, in fact, to write uh, even uh, an observed energy of the P in the, in the frame where the top is at rest. By a simple Lorentz transformation, it tells me what was the energy in the last frame. Very good. Now, E B star is uh, a known value due to the two-quantic kinematics, which I should write in a good place. So, the E star value is uh, mt squared minus mw squared divided by 2mt from conservation of form momentum, essentially. So, really simple schematics. Uh, the only problem that, you know, what I've done is just not doable event by event. Uh, because event by event we don't know for sure the velocity of the top and we don't even know the direction at uh, which the p work has been emitted in the rest frame of the top. So the kinematics would be extremely simple, but the lack of information that you have when you measure things in the experiment just you know prevents you from doing this back, boost back and uh, you know and obtaining uh, one energy from the other. Uh, so what I will do is to construct uh, the energy in the lab frame, starting from this knowledge in, in the top rest frame, uh, and in integrating first on the angles uh, and then on the on the boosts of the top, in a way that uh, makes clear how the distribution of the energies actually emerges. So uh, I'm just rewriting the equation more simply, neglecting the top uh, sorry the P mass, which is uh, later reintroduced, and uh, uh, then I pick tops of a given boost. These tops uh, are uh, so flying with a given velocity um, and uh, uh, will decay with some angle uh, as before cos theta. What I do at this point uh, is to take uh, unpolarized top sample, which means that I'm taking a sample of tops, so I don't know, 10,000 tops. Uh, each of them have its own elicity, uh, uh, I don't care which one. All I care of is that at the end of the 10,000 in, in, in my sample, all elicities are populated with the same probability. This is what happens when you produce tops from QCD or QED interactions. So it's a very good approximation for top production of the LHC. And uh, uh, owing to this uh, uh, property of the unpolarization of, uh, of the top sample, I can say that the cost theta distribution is a flat distribution. So it's only phase based distribution, essentially. So, which means that if I take this formula for a fixed gamma, Say gamma p. I can draw the distribution that emerges in the lab frame from the single valued value in the, in the rest frame in EB star by just changing the cos theta from minus 1 to 1 with a flat probability. And this means I'm obtaining this funny rectangle shape distribution. It's funny, and you, you, you never observe it because remember I was fixing the boost of the, the top, which is not an actual situation. There is an example where lab experiments use this for W mass measurements, but uh, it never really worked uh, uh, very well. But so, just to say that a situation like this has been measured, in fact, in real life. But for the LHC, you never see it, because for the moment I was fixing uh, the, the, the top boost. What is uh, remarkable of this rectangle distribution is that uh, it always uh, goes a little bit beyond and below uh, the, the, the center of mass value. And in fact, the center of mass value is the geometric average of the, of the ending of the rectangle shape. Uh, but most not, I think most notable is the fact that this guarantees that you always have uh, some, uh, some, some part of the distribution covering the, the, the restraint value. Now, very good. 
if you have to make now prediction for the total and observed distribution, what you, you will do is just sum up different uh, 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 contribution coming from different boosts of the top, just taking into account that all the, every boost has its own probability. So if you have a, a bigger probability of producing a top at some boost value, you will give it a, a, a higher rectangle, still spanning uh, uh, you know, uh, a horizontally uh, a range which is uh, given by the Higgs one. And you repeat the exercise for all the different values of the, out which you can sample at the top of the distribution. Now, you don't even need to know what is this distribution, but you will know that uh, the, emerging the emerging energy distribution is just the sum of, uh, say, the rectangle shapes of this type, which I'm giving you here as a kind of a multi-layer wedding cake, right, where you have different uh, rectangles summed up. Each comes from a different boost of the top. And all of them, as I said, cover the, uh, the, the center of mass value. This automatically guarantees that what was a single value distribution in the top rest plane now has become a distribution of a given shape, which you don't care of, but with a specific property of having a maximum at the place called E star, which, I remind you, is this function of MT and W. Now, this might seem quite simple, but uh, at the end of the day, it's essentially telling you that uh, while you didn't know anything on event by event basis, you are now able uh, to measure uh, the top mass, uh, if you want, or a combination of top and end up mass, uh, by looking at the entire distribution of the entire sample and extracting the maximum of this, uh, uh, of this distribution. That can, you can make improvements on the formula and on the derivation to show that uh, the B mass is never a problem unless you go to tops with a boost larger than 500, which is not LHC, it's not even uh, the 500 TV machines, actually. But now, I think, uh, you, know, you start seeing where I'm going. I'm essentially, I will try to use this peak as if it was some sort of Brad Wigner peak, okay, in a different, uh, of course, a different way, to extract some mass by looking at this problem. And I think the nice thing is that I'm connecting this variant uh, energy to the invariant combination MTW uh, of MTA and MW. Is it correct to somehow to say that you assume basically that the production is left right symmetric, it's QCD, mm -hmm. so there's no polarization there, yes. even though the decay is from by the weak interaction? Yeah. Okay. yeah. But the, the key is that uh, whatever it does, the decay, no? You start with 50-50 in this case, yeah, yeah. Uh, because QCD is made like that. Okay, now to just have a feeling of what I'm talking about, you can compare energy distribution for big quarks produ produced at different colliders with the uh, uh, same place, same colliders, but the PT distributions, so transverse momentum, so projection of the energy essentially on only one, say, a two-dimensional surface instead of uh, the three-dimensional energy. This is normally used because it retains uh, some longitudinal boost invariance. So it somehow it, it tries to you know, attach, it's still attached to the importance of Lorentz invariance. Whereas here is what I got if I completely disregard the invariance event by event, but I try to recover it on the, in, the, in the distribution. And the shapes show very clearly that despite I'm using very different colliders to produce my tops, the distributions of energy vary widely in shape but they all have the same maximum, which is easily trackable from the yellow curve, which is a 630 GB collider. And, uh, you know, there are all the other shapes, despite becoming broader and broader, because of the bigger and bigger boost of the tops that are achievable, they keep the same position of the peak. For PTs, the changes are, uh, say, of the same order in terms of shape, but the peaks uh, are moving in some way, which I couldn't predict from prime principle. You have to make a simulation, or maybe you can even try to guess it, but anyways, uh, it's not as stable as you get from, from, for the energy. So this picture should show a little bit what uh, is uh, you know, the underlying idea I'm trying to, to use. Uh, measuring any distribution of this type, I can indeed recover something which is this combination of masses. So the question we asked uh, the first, very first place in 2012 was, was this useful at all in any way? Uh, partly due to the fact that a result of this type for the pion mass, uh, for the pion decay to gamma gamma is known from 1971. We discovered it uh, afterwards, but uh, it 
something which was known in cosmic ray physics. And uh, we started asking ourselves if this can be useful in practice. So here is what we got from a preliminary study, if you want, on uh, leading order physics. Huh? Leading order meaning that we have uh, uh, only leading order magic select in Medgraf, which is a, a Monte Carlo event generator. Uh, described uh, later uh, shower with, uh, parton shower with PTA and some detector effects uh, with a detector emulator called FS. And uh, essentially reproducing some atlas uh, analysis uh, uh, cuts uh, for the identification of tops, uh, we have basically made 100 self-experiments, so 100 times what the LHC could do. Each of the experiments uh, uh, would give you an energy distribution, uh, data for energy distribution of this sort. We were using 15% of an LHC7 data. And uh, with some fit technology on how to extract the maximum of these quite scattered uh, uh, data points using a particular article ones, we are able to extract the top mass to some precision. Uh, now, the statistical level, looking at the 100 observed experiments, we expected a 2.5 GT statistical uncertainty in the extraction of the top mass, which was rather encouraging. Uh, only uh, issue is that uh, uh, what we've done is uh, a leading order uh, simulation, which is not very different from what you see sometimes in measurements, but uh, uh, we are not happy with that in the sense that uh, here I should add 10% uh, uncertainty, roughly speaking, coming from next leading order QCD, which I've not computed. In the game, uh, uh, later, in fact, has become precisely quantify what is this contribution that is there. However, I think uh, the message is clear that uh, despite uh, having used uh, uh, Lorentz variant quantities and trying to correlate that with uh, the top mass, pretty much as you do if you use, I don't know, the PT of the lepton, or the length, the decay length of, of the piadron, uh, we, we have been able to exploit invariances of, uh, of the kinematics, which you cannot do with these observables here. And so we have obtained uh, some sort of mixture of uh, observables that traditionally belong uh, to the category of Lorentz invariants, like the mass of the bottom and the, and the lepton, uh, still making something which is much closer, practically speaking, uh, to the non Lorentz invariants, so the PT or uh, other things that are used uh, like the length, the gay length of the B. And so we have kind of created an hybrid thing, so which hopefully gets, uh, I would say, both, uh, I say the best of the bot works. We will see if it's actually the case. Um, now, as I said, uh, there are issues that need to be discussed, which are analogous uh, to the emission of, uh, of photons uh, from the Z, and that are uh, for the top uh, the emission of gluons, like this one in, uh, in, the, in the top decay. Uh, and these are what make uh, essentially crucial to evaluate uh, the next leading order correction. Okay, so so far uh, uh, it was say encouraging because it means that uh, what I showed it means that leading order physics was very well under control. In fact, uh, we have been able to find uh, applications for this idea thanks to the leading order working very well in the other, other model physics. Uh, to answer a number of questions that range uh, from uh, yes, mass, me mass measurements of that type of Duino decay uh, to counting how many dark matter even are produced in each decay for uh, say, distinguishing exotic models uh, where you have two guys instead of one produced in each chain, so different things. Uh, but now we want to make a step and uh, really see if uh, this idea can be you know, uplifted to some level to become uh, a method for precision mass measurements. So if you're able to exploit these very simple uh, arguments uh, to a level of, say, 1% precision. For example, if you have this gluino, uh, ah. sorry, uh, neutralino, uh, gluino pair production with neutralino decay, for example, you cannot use this transverse uh, method, right? Uh, so uh, I'm changing that into? So you are uh, trying to substitute by your method also to treat that? Uh, well, if this works at precision level, one day we might measure the Greenham mass precisely, but I don't know if this is what you were asking. Um, I mean, whether, whether your method is extrapolate, can be extrapolated also to the green case. This is done. This is this paper 1309. This paper precisely measures uh, the Greeno, the Spotom, and the Kynos, looking at the energies of the two Bs that you get from each of these decay. Uh, so this is already, you know, this was our original motivation, to be honest. Okay? We started because we wanted to attack uh, problems of that type. And 
uh, case very interested that, uh, well, whatever, a few weeks ago on paper, is the case where the B is off shadow, which is more complex and there are different features to be exploited, but even that can be done. So in that sense, I kind of now say that the beyond the standard model physics program of this idea is sort of about to be exhausted. There is only one paper we're finishing about measuring other type of decay chains. But now, the, at least for me, the interesting things are uh, trying to see if you can make precision. For BSM, we have pretty much we have done enough that I'm, I'm satisfied with it. <laughs> OK. So what are the things that uh, happen once you go and add uh, uh, one more alpha strong coupling uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the way you produce our TK in the top. So in general you have uh, these blue gluons, uh, no dynamps, uh, that are what they call the corrections to the production mechanism. And they amount essentially to produce tops uh, okay, on shell. So tops are three on shell. But instead of being produced just uh, Simple, in the simplest uh, decay production mechanism, maybe to have an extra blue one emitted yeah, before the top uh, is actually going on shadow. Uh, or there are other things which are instead uh, this blue one, like this, where the top was in shell, but basically together with the decay, it also emitted an extra blue one. Both things uh, are uh, NLO correction. Uh, some of them are easier to evaluate in certain programs, some are less easy, but all of them need to be evaluated. Um, and once you start uh, this calculation, then uh, you will realize a number of subjects that have come out. So, um, first of all, the point I want us to make is that uh, these type of corrections are very irrelevant to us, uh, due to the fact uh, that uh, they are still uh, QCD production of tops, so they will not change uh, the fact that tops are produced in both elicities with 50-50 uh, chances, and so all the assumptions on the little proof I gave are still valid. They don't change the fact that the tops are on shell, so the little proof still goes through. And so, for all these uh, type of corrections that change only the production mechanism, our result is essentially uh, unchanged. So you can take all type of initial state radiation, uh, you know, the uh, T channel radiation, anything you want to draw of this type. And uh, uh, the proof of what I showed, we, for the B parton, uh, for the B parton, would go essentially unchanged. And you can just make a state vector that now, say, if you really want to be precise, maybe includes the jet mass instead of the big work mass. But besides that, there is really no moral uh, difference with what I showed already. The real game, uh, well, there is, well, this is just a further proof that uh, if you make initial state radiation, you can really see again that uh, peaks staying uh, not changed uh, compared to big peaks. But uh, I'll show it if you really want to see it uh, later. But just, uh, you know, you, I think you are kind of um, convinced that this type of uh, corrections are not changing my arguments in any way. What really makes a big difference is the case where the top, like here, is decaying in a more complicated kind of state which is a three-body fine state, essentially, where a gluon is uh, well uh, separated from the B and the, the W, and essentially makes uh, what I would call uh, a three-body decay of the top. So this is what I need to study very precisely, because it breaks uh, my original prediction. My original prediction was just for uh, tops decaying into B W. I never emitted any gluon in, what, in that argument, so I need to improve on that side. If it was only TT bar produced with any number of blue ones and then followed by living log the top decay, I would be still in position to make a statement on the peak. I would say that uh, the, uh, this green curve, some green curve of this type, would be the spectrum in the lab. The shape itself, uh, I don't know it very well, but I know for sure where the peak is going to be at the best frame. What I'm adding? I'm adding that in some cases the decay is uh, the NLO decay, if you want. And the decay, usually being a three body decay, huh, gives you less energetic bits because now there is one more object you have to share energy with. And uh, so it will give you something of this type, uh, this red curve, uh, whose shape again is very unknown. The peak position of the shape is even unknown as well. The normalization of it, uh, you can figure it out uh, by doing some little calculations that it must be in the order of 5%, because after all, it's a kind of a, a, say, a three body, uh, say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alpha strong correction to the weak decay of, uh, of the top. 
uh, forget about the exact size. Uh, what you need to know at the end is the combined spectrum that is the sum of these two things uh, that takes into account the overall top and the low production and decay. And to do that, uh, you need to go uh, to some next to the order, uh, computer code, which is in our case MCFM, uh, which can essentially compute for you uh, at, the, at the jet level uh, where jets are made by bees and gluons, not, uh, not, not shower, no hadrons at the moment, can make, uh, no, not yet, can make the spectra at living order, which are the green points, or at, uh, for instance, next living order where you have uh, the uh, decay and the production fully, you know, uh, accounted for in a kind of way. Comparing the spectra, you will see that uh, as long as you are at high energy, high energy of the bee, the two are basically the same distribution. But when you go to low energies of the bee, you will start seeing uh, the red component that is uh, taking more and more importance. And in fact, uh, the, the, the NLO usually overshoots the LO when you go at energies in the range of 20, 30, 40 G. So, uh, we understand more or less what type of spectra we get from NLO. Uh, now, the point is to make a correlation between the NLO spectra in particular their maximum uh, and uh, uh, the top mass. So uh, what we need to do at this point is to make uh, some part of the plate of the same type if you like, where now instead of what I put originally here, which was some uh, invariant mass, I put EP star, which is my extraction uh, of, uh, of the peak of the spectrum for a given uh, top mass that I put in my code. So what I'm doing essentially is to decide one pole mass, pick some of the parameters that are necessary to compute the spectra. So for instance, the normalization and the factorization scales, and transform this to MCFN essentially to a prediction of the differential cross-section so of the spectrum of the bees at the LHC. One spectrum could be these red and blue points here. Now on that, I will apply some fitting technology that allows me to extract uh, the maximum of this function, despite being the function a bit broad, so not completely trivial to extend. <coughs> and then I'll, call, I'll make essentially a band that uh, uh, for each choice of the top mass and the normalization scales uh, will associate uh, to each uh, mass choice and mass uh, sorry, scale choice uh, for even mass, uh, another, scale, another mass and uh, three different scale choices, for instance, will associate a prediction from QCP for the expected peak. Position. Now, this will be a little away from the leading order prediction, and my job is to compute how much you go away from the leading order number. In general, you're happy when this function is narrow, so this band is narrow because you have little scale sensitivity, and uh, you're happy when this object is sort of steep because uh, an error measurement on the peak position translates in a small error in the top mass. Uh, there are different things that contribute uh, here now. Mm -hmm. Due to the, mostly due to the fact that you have to make jets to, to make a prediction. Jets meaning that you have to take the gluons and the bees and make sure that they are treated as a single object if they, if they are close enough and say they fly in the same direction, or that they are distinguished objects if they are too much far away one from the other. The way you say it close or far is something that you need to build in details, but this is more or less the idea. And uh, essentially, what can happen is the following. You might be, uh, say, uh, reconstructing a jet that is made of uh, a B and uh, a gluon that it has here itself, which would essentially reconduct, uh, uh, despite the splitting, would reconduct the top decay to a W plus jet decay. It's a B jet, but let's say it's just one object. Or there are cases where the gluon, as I said, it's very well separated from the B, and then it forms an independent jet. So then you have a B that itself uh, it has lost some energy because it has emitted either here or before uh, the top decay some some new one. And there are also unwanted uh, class things of this type where gluons that are emitted somewhere else in the event from a, a different parton, a correlated parton, ended up flying uh, close by. The, uh, our B, and so they are put together. Now, all these three phenomena are taken into account in the calculation, and the combined result is what, in the end, gives you uh, the shift between the LO and the NLO uh, uh, result, and also the scale dependence. 
Okay, so what I've done here is to put, uh, for a given input mass in uh, MCFM, uh, say the fitted uh, mass that compared to the uh, uh, leading order uh, expectation. For instance, here I'm taking 173, and you see that for given uh, uh, jet maker and given scale choices, I get three different uh, extracted top masses. They are far away something of the order plus minus 1 GB, which you can consider as a theory uncertainty on my extraction of the top mass. Uh, the distance between the input and the output mass, if you want, is due to the combination of effects that are loss of energy due to this decay and gain of energy due to uh, uh, this phenomenon of uh, uh, catching gluons that are from somewhere else. So, the interplay of these two phenomena gives you the final shift. Uh, but the most important thing, at least for the uh, theory uncertainty on the extraction of the top mass, is how big is this band. And in this case, it's uh, of the order of uh, one, uh, an error of plus minus 1 GB. Now, as you can understand, in this game of making jets, the chances that you recluster something with the original B, or that you capture essentially garbage from somewhere else, depend on the criterion that you have used to define something as close or farther. Now, in a very simplistic way, you can think of a cone of a given angle around the B, and if uh, extra gluons come in that, uh, in that cone, you are making a jet with that glue one as well, so like here. Or uh, maybe not, if instead you have this glue one emitted outside of that cone. The cone size is given by a parameter that is called R. It's not exactly faithful what I'm saying, but more or less renders the idea. Uh, and for a concise of 0.5, this was our prediction. Now, this is one of the three parameters in making our experiment. You can change it, it's not uh, given by, well, it's given by CMS at the moment. But, uh, you, you could change it, let's say, in theory, in fact, I'm doing. Uh, and uh, if you make instead another choice, which is a much bigger jet, a four times larger jet, uh, R equal 1, in fact, uh, you see that the prediction has moved, uh, and now it uh, overshoots. With compared to the, to the leading order number, uh, with a comparable uncertainty on the scales uh, of order again plus minus 1g. Now it's nice, and I can enter in more detail for who's interested later, that uh, the scale dependence in these two plots is actually flipped. You see that uh, the green point here is up, and the green point in this other is down. The green uh, <coughs> it identifies uh, low scale choices compared to the, uh, say the nominal uh, Scale uh, uh, of scales in what I'm talking about. And uh, this means uh, that there is some interesting phenomenon going on, which I can discuss maybe with interest people later, uh, which has to do with some kind of cancellation, which is shown better if you do a jet size of 0.7, where you see that uh, basically you reach the point uh, where, thanks to the suitably taken jet size, uh, you're getting a cancellation of, uh, say, uh, much energy is lost due to the emissions of gluons, uh, these gluons not being captured. It's uh, essentially the same amount of energy that uh, it's uh, obtained instead from uh, re reclustering a gluon from somewhere else uh, with your B. And uh, okay, it's natural that uh, these two phenomena compensate each other because one is a loss of energy, the other is a gain of energy. Uh, it's not so trivial that in a kind of, you know, uh, how, how to call it, uh, conceivable jet radius of order 0.7 and the two effects compensate. So this is interesting, that might be you know, an interesting feature to exploit. It's, I think, uh, a natural consequence of this behavior of compensation of the two phenomena that uh, the scale dependence of one phenomenon cancels a little bit the scale dependence of the other phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon you want to exploit uh, uh, to extreme values, uh, and maybe later I have more data on this if you want to see them. But uh, I think it's quite interesting that uh, when you go to a jet radius uh, slightly optimized, uh, like this one, 0.7, uh, then that certainty from the theory would become of the order of 0.5 uh, really. Now, I this is. Yes? I suppose you're using NTKT, right? Yes. Uh, well, I understand there is no other choice that I'm allowed to, to, yeah, yeah, to sure. do, no? <laughs> <laughs> Even 0.7 is unlawful, so. <laughs> going a little bit away from what I'm supposed to do. I mean. But yeah, all of this is uh, anti kt chance. Yeah. OK, so uh, just to summarize, uh, we have done a 
full evaluation, at least at partonic level, of what happens when you emit extra gluons in the top production and decay. We especially dedicated some effort into understanding what is the interplay of jet mating when you have uh, different uh, uh, patterns that can be clustered together. Uh, and some interest, interesting phenomena, as you've seen, has, been, uh, has emerged. But more in general, I would say that uh, the picture that emerges is the, the following. There are uh, observables that are standard observables, like it could be the, the, the decay length of the hadron, uh, the hadron or the PT of the lepton, anything you like, which are computed by living order and then corrected by some corrections at next to living order. Fine, no problem with that. And there are some other observables, like these uh, 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 invariants, uh, uh, sorry, like these energy peaks, uh, which have OK, a living order value. Uh, but that are affected in a, they are expected at least to be affected less by the same type of corrections because uh, uh, in these diagrams essentially it's only the green gluons that cause the, the major trouble. And those are only uh, those are the only ones that violate my otherwise very robust uh, theory result of my invariants. Only these ones. So if I call them uh, final state radiation, which is a, a bad name but uh, makes a endless idea. I can say that uh, for, uh, say, very briefly speaking, for the same type of corrections that would affect the observable O, uh, I expect a little suppression in the effects that they have on energy peaks because uh, I have to pass by what it's, you know, badly named uh, final state radiation effects. And in general, this gives a chance that uh, an energy peak can be more stable under uh, an uh, network order correction than a generic observable. Now, nobody asked, but sometimes that people do. Uh, what do you do with electroweak production of tops? Uh, so I could have had the Z boson here instead of a blue one. This would be now no longer respecting my rules. Or maybe I had a top uh, uh, pair mediated by uh, S channel Z boson. All of these exist, and all of these uh, will perturb my results. However, it's known that uh, this, uh, this size, the section of these processes is below 10 to minus 3 level. So for the level of precision we are seeking, it should not be a problem. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it's nice uh, to remember how, in a sense, uh, we created a spot in between uh, non Lorentz invariant uh, strategies and fully Lorentz invariant uh, uh, ways to extract uh, the top mass. Um, there are further things you can do with this by exploiting the fact that uh, for now I described the B quarks and B jets, but in real life there are B hadrons, and B hadrons pretty much uh, inherit uh, from the B quark if you like, all the properties that I have described. So in principle I can derive further uh, observables, which could be hadron energies, or uh, the k-path again uh, of the p-hadrons can be somehow interpreted uh, in this language of energy peaks, maybe looking at uh, a decay path, uh, at the mean decay path. Uh, 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 so there are further things we are working on uh, to say, uh, branch uh, in different ways this idea into different objects. Uh, of course, this is very good for the reason I started with, that you need to have a set of observables that make you confident on your top mass extraction. And then this, let's say, different type of things that uh, comes out of uh, this, this single idea is uh, one way at least to test it. Okay, so yeah, this is more or less uh, uh, the conclusion. Uh, at the level of, uh, of where it is, uh, to the hard facts, I think uh, that the main conclusion for now is that using a full and low calculation, the, we are able to have an uncertainty, at least a theory uncertainty, at the level of 1 GB, which is less than 1%. So to that extent, I would say that uh, our original goal, which was to prove that uh, the energy peak method can be used for precision, is fully achieved. So say the BSM person inside me that started looking at the Gruino it's quite happy that this is actually something that can be done in a precision. Now, for LHC purposes and top mass purposes, this is on the verge of being interesting, I would say. Maybe it's even interesting for real. And we're working to make it, uh, say, on a more uh, solid, uh, solid ground. But I would say it's already very, very good. Um, yeah, and here there are a few things that we are loose ends we're fixing, but uh, more or less, uh, I would say this is. Uh, Some question for the yeah, when, when you go for any jet 
size parameter r. Let's take, take a very small one, 0.4 or so. And then there is a shift between the observed mass and the, the one that you were after that you have to somehow take into account. Yes. Have to calculate. Yes. How, how precisely do you think you can predict that? Because the scale variation is small, but it's a few GBs, maybe four or five. Well, the scale variation, the, actual, the uh, maximum excursion is here, it's 2 GV, mm -hmm. maximum excursion between the top and lower half values. Uh, now, you can call this the uncertainty, and then it's 2 GVs, or you can call it plus minus 1 GV, it's a little bit uh, yeah. a matter of, I don't know, what this is your philosophy. Uh, that's why I put both of them <laughs> normally in the slide, but that's the prediction. So, and the scale variation is small, but, but the shift get to the actual <laughs> value of the top mass, mm -hmm. you have to put in from theory, I guess. Uh, there, yeah. there, how precisely can you calculate that number? Mm, let's say, I would say that at least at NLO, the prediction is that at this jet radius value, you have a minus sort of 4. Huh? So your bias, it's 4 GD. Mm -hmm. The bias has, an, it, it has itself an error, which is the scale prediction. From TV. So, if you want uh, um, the, the error, it's the, the error on the top mass you extract at the end of the day is the error on the bias. And the bias, it has an error which is either you because it, it can be a bias given by the red or the green or the blue point. So, and this is plus or minus one GB. And the full uncertainty on the bias is, is included in that scale variable. The scale variation accounts for the, well, it's a one way to account the theory uncertainty. But if you want, uh, if I didn't have scale variations, then I would tell you, with quote unquote, it's a precision that if you input 173 in, uh, in the code, what you call 173, then your output uh, is 169. So if you measure a peak at an energy which, with this formula, returns you 169 for the top mass. It is because, in nature, that mass was 173 due to this uh, red, uh, this, uh, what it was. That doesn't depend due, on due any to, other... to this thing, to this red contribution, which I, is the actual thing I'm evaluating. What is the effect of this uh, red, red curve? I change something else, the PDFs or matching scheme or whatever, it's oh, not much very more than that. Okay, here there is no matching scheme yet, uh, if I understand what you mean by that, because this is still partonic. So, we will do something for that, so we will have a, uh, uh, so, uh, we will have a matched uh, prediction at some point. Uh, the only issue is that uh, this decay thing, it's available only for web. So for now, even that, uh, it's not clear how you will evaluate that certainty, but it, it will happen. It's not available yet simply because the Powell thing exists only since December. So it's not really that. Where we started, it was clearly uh, not doable. Now maybe yes. And it will be done with collaboration with some of the authors on that calculation, actually. Um, the PDFs, uh, maybe I have some material in the background, but in the background. Uh, but um, due to uh, all the good properties I showed, you know, how, how uh, you look at the leading order prediction, for instance. Yeah. Now is probably the time I want to show this slide. Um, PDFs amount to change the way you produce the tops. If you produce them more boosted, less boosted, or things like that. Which is equivalent, in a sense, to say that I produce tops uh, associated with a jet, for instance. It's a way to mimic that, uh, not too fully, but to an extent. Uh, now, if I need an extra pattern, means some boosting the tops. But as I said, the tops are still QCD tops and uh, they are on shell. And now here you can look uh, at uh, uh, what are the energy, the VT distribution and the energy distributions for different uh, hardness of the initial state variation. And you see that the energy of the P is getting a wide variation in shape, but if you start uh, from the inclusive distribution, which is this lighter green here, uh, and then you make harder and harder cuts on the, on the jet. You see the shape is changing. At some, some point it gets so flat that it's even hard to talk about the peak. But uh, if you keep it a moderate uh, PT, you clearly see the peak here. And it stays at the same pace where it was. So effects 
which is not the case for uh, for uh, for, uh, for for PT. Just to finish the point. So effect of this type are really are really under control because uh, anything that goes into changing the address of the tops, including explicit radiation or change of PTFs, they're not making any effect on the liquid water prediction. But this is before you consider the FSR. This is uh, yes before now. That cancellation between energy uh, okay. ISR that gets yeah. into the cone, FSR that goes out of the cone. That might be affected by the moves by things again. So part of the cancellation has to do with the precise description of that ISR, agreed. Um, this is why we don't want to push the cancellation to some extreme level. Uh, no, I should show you that, because the cancellation can become very severe, and we don't want to live there. That's essentially my way to hedge against uh, that type of problem. So you keep the scale variation large enough, that's yeah. my, my problem. So this is the cancellation of play. You can choose a jet radius where the cancellation gives you zero scale sensitivity. If I was living there, okay, then I would agree with you. I'm relying 100% on the PDFs and everything. Although, if you redo this plot with different PDFs, it's not that different, but it's somewhat different. Uh, instead, we are living, uh, say, either at 0.5, which is over here, or at uh, 1, I showed you results. And maybe you want to live at 0.7, okay, which is Two words being optimal, but not yet at the level where you're seeing this hard cancellation. So uh, one way we have to essentially evaluate how dangerous is this phenomenon is to evaluate the, uh, the scale uncertainty that comes from uh, uh, only the production or the scale uncertainty that comes only from the game. And uh, if you have only production, this is what you get. Okay? The scale uncertainty grows as you grow your uh, jet radius because the stuff that you're putting in, which are depending on, uh, on, uh, on the emission of jets from, say, the initial state or things like that, are uh, bringing in more uh, uh, dependence on the, on the scale. And uh, you see you know, how it's getting bigger because the, the effect itself grows with the jet area. The bigger the jet, the more stuff you bring, you bring in and so the more you become sensitive to the probabilities of emitting these things in the first place, so alpha strong at uh, the emission vertex. So um, if you go at 0.8 or so, you would have like a 700 MeV uncertainty in the production mechanism, which then, thanks to the cancellation, at the same 0 0.8 jet radius have become zero-ish. And then, okay, you know that you are playing with fire, you cannot can really defend that statement. Uh, however, if you do the same calculation for a point like 0.7, you see that the uncertainty has got better only by 20 or 10 percent. So the production only scale uncertainty is on the order of uh, 600 MBs, and by having production and decay at the same time, thanks to the correlation, mm, which is specific to the entire set I've used, and I completely agree with you, uh, is getting from 600 MBs to 500. So it's not really a severe cancellation. Um, so I don't know if this answers yeah. to your thing because I don't have this plot for, uh, for the PDF change, but more or less. Uh, I have not seen any single loop in your transparencies. And uh -huh. without the loops, talking about next to in order is, is meaningless. I don't need to draw them because MCFM <laughs> makes them for me. So there is a, there is a, a full and a low calculation uh, inside what you, you've seen. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not able to show the next slide, but you know, these are real emissions which change the kinematics. And those I will see more directly in my distributions. 
The virtual, of course, they affect the prediction because they change the weight of the leading order kinematics, agreed. And this is taken into account uh, by the, the calculation itself. Okay? Um, but they are, well, numerically, they may become equally important. It's, uh, I don't really want to make a statement on that. But intuitively, I do, at least I understand the trends of the effects that are emerging by looking at the real radiation. In fact, there is even a chance that one effect, uh, uh, an effect like uh, the, these green gluons, uh, if it was not available by the web, we could have simulated, say, the NLO by doing a matched uh, prediction uh, with TT bar RDK level plus jets. If one didn't have the Boweg uh, calculation that uh, was made uh, public last year in, in the same time. But yeah, loops are there. Okay. Hidden in their code. It, well, hidden. Uh, they are okay, somewhere. Yeah, there. Yes. There is a. The, the second point is that you cannot make physics from this plot. Because, I mean, if there is a cancellation of, of the scale independence, this is an indication that your theoretical uh, error is underestimated. But there is no physics there. So be careful when, when you. When you uh, extract some conclusion about this, okay. this cancellation. So, thanks for the remark. This is something I've been thinking for now three months. Maybe I've yet reached a conclusion. So, we can definitely talk later about it. Um, I tell you what I've done. So, I've checked what happens at this cancellation place and uh, decided that this is not a place where you want to make a prediction, precisely for what you're saying. Uh, because uh, it's where exactly you are underestimating the theory certainty, owing to the fact uh, that uh, yeah, here is a good place. Uh, uh, there is a there is some correction to the NLO that comes uh, from the jet areas, and another correction that comes from the uh, out of cone emissions, essentially from the low gap part. And uh, the way these two are correlated at the next to next, uh, I don't know, of course. It's only. Okay, a part of the correlation that I'm getting it and that it's cancelling that comes uh, from the fact that they both have alpha at mu r in front. Okay, this is what we are actually observing as a cancellation. Now, um, the fact that they both have uh, this alpha in common is sort of well understood. But what are the corrections to coefficients front? I agree with you. They are not just the logs that are I am evaluating. So there is a risk uh, of, uh, of uh, say, underestimating the theory error here. And that's why I confront with the, um, with the production only error. Okay? If I had an error which was from production, I don't know, 10 GVs, which cancelled with a minus 10 GV from the decay, then I, I know that I'm fooling myself. So what I'm quote unquote happy with is to say that uh, 0.7, which is a, actually a standard value for jet making, you have a 600 MeV in the, in the production, which becomes, so thanks to the cancellation, 500 MeVs. Now, this is a level of cancellation that I think can be trusted, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't push it uh, farther than that. So, in that sense, uh, uh, I agree. There is a, a, the risk of making a wrong statement here. And if I can add to it, uh, we plan, but we will not maybe do it now, to correct, uh, to try to compute these coefficients at the low. So these are both of them the low corrections to TT bar. So themselves are a low in their own uh, essence. But um, there is uh, an idea of computing TT jet at the low. And so at least to see if this part, the production correction, is under control. So that this band, I can really compute it at the low and see if uh, the scale variation here was cache or uh, maybe was fooling myself. But I, I have to make it clear, the cancellation that one could you know, try to exploit by this thing, it's not physics. Uh, I, I fully agree with that. And that's why we have drawn, if you want, uh, a band around this number of uh, 0.8, where we don't want to go for any, for any, you know, for any, any actual study. Yeah, I think this is a good point to stop. Uh, so we say to speak again. Thank you. Yeah, also today and tomorrow if yeah. you have more detailed questions.